I don't write for an audience. I don't... Maybe novelists write for audiences. I, I'm not aware as a poet that I'm writing for an audience. I don't even know if I'm writing for myself. I'm writing to make a, a beautiful thing. I'm writing to make a beautiful poem. And when I finish that poem, I start again to make another beautiful poem. Uh, after it's written, I send it out to an audience. I might read it at a reading, or I might publish it in a magazine, or I publish it in a book. But none of those are the purposes for which I write. I, there's a kind of an obsessive nature to what a poet does. And really, I suppose, it's just to make something beautiful with language. I'm asked the question many times whether I make a living from writing. And in, as a poet, it's, it's kind of a joke. You, you don't make a living from writing poetry. And I've never pretended that I could make a living from that. Uh, in the last four or five years, I've been a writer in residence at various colleges and universities, and that has been a kind of a subsidy for me to continue on with my writing, but I've always done other things, uh, a thousand different jobs, building houses, working in sawmills, uh, um, doing nothing, picking apples, uh, anything that would give me enough money to keep going with my writing. But to make a, make a living from poetry? No, I don't think it's possible. I, I, I know no one who does. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone in the world who makes a living directly from their poetry. They all seem to do, they all have to do something else. One of the places where Patrick Lane has been writer in residence is Lethbridge University, which stands fortress-like among the bald and rolling hills of southern Alberta. Positions like this allow poets to be much more visible than they used to be. They also give poets that extra income necessary for their survival as full-time writers. Lane has been in steady demand since he won the Governor General's Award for Poetry in 1978. The relationship you got to work the relationship as writer in residence, a poet may give readings and lectures. In Lethbridge, Lane spoke to students in several classes. Primarily, however, the poet is available to students for consultation on their own creative efforts. It's the half-grown cat. Well, I mean, psychologically, as you're building your poem, you're building a dramatic structure, right? Mm -hmm. So if you bring in an image, then that image is, is a part of the whole thing. It's the first, mm -hmm. it's the first alternative image that is going to define somebody in it. I mean, it's got, in other mm -hmm. words, it's got to relate exactly. to one of the characters, yeah, okay? It will relate so now this, that. now this is either, you know, when I say talk about the unconscious uh -huh. working, you know, the irrational working, you have set up an animal that resembles the narrator, right? Okay. I was born in 1939, uh, born in Nelson, British Columbia. And I, it's a question that's often been asked me, uh, you know, when I decided to be an artist or when I decided to be a poet, and it's always a difficult sort of question to answer. I know when I was a, a kid, I always wanted to be an artist, but I don't even know if I knew what that meant. Uh, I think I probably meant that I wanted to be a painter or something like that. I know I used to love you know, coloring books and making pictures and things like that. Uh, I don't know that I was, uh, had any thought of being a writer, but oddly enough, uh, my family were always great storytellers. Uh, matter of fact, I learned how to lie when I was really a, a little, a little kid, you know, I mean, it was sort of a survival technique and, uh, that kind of tall tale thing, you know, where everything becomes exaggerated. Probably because I had two brothers who were very close to me in the same, in age. And uh, we were constantly sort of vying with each other for, I don't know, for my mother's attention, for my father's attention. Uh, I have no idea. But uh, we endlessly sort of told stories and anecdotes about uh, things that had happened to us. And maybe to, in an odd way, a lot of the poetry that I've written in my life is narrative poetry. And uh, it's built around that kind of story. And when you sort of put it in those Popular terms, poets like Patrick so Lane can, in a given year, and receive invitations from several parts of the country to give readings of his work. More and more people of all ages are attending readings, another important way in which poets are getting out into the community. Most poetry, after all, is meant to be read aloud. The bird. The bird you captured is dead. I told you it would die, but you would not learn from my telling. You wanted to cage a bird in your hands and learn to fly. Listen again. You must not handle birds. They cannot fly through your fingers. You are not a nest, and a feather is not made of blood and bone. Only words.
can fly for you like birds on the wall of the sun. A bird is a poem that talks of the end of cages. I don't know if writers have goals. Maybe prose writers have goals because they have such long-term projects they have to deal with. I mean, you write a novel, it's a three or four year uh, process. For a poet, uh, the, the goal is the next poem you write. And uh, maybe in uh, two or three years, if you accumulate enough of them, you might think about putting them together in a collection of poetry. But the goal is just the next piece of blank paper I pick up and, uh, and write down. Poets write, basically, one or two poems all their lives. Uh, the same poem in all of its endless variations. You go back to the same things that concern you. Now, what, what those themes are, what the, what the concept is to the poem I try to write, I, I'm not really sure. I'm a little bewildered by that. I, I don't know if I could tell you that. Maybe a reader could tell me that or tell uh, someone else that. But I know I go back and back to the same kinds of things. And images recur over and over again. Uh, images of struggle and uh, images uh, of violence. But then... I'm not particularly fascinated by violence. It's just that maybe I grew up in a very violent world. It was a very natural, in the West here, in, in the small towns, etc. that's a, a naturally violent world. I mean, animals live, animals die, uh, farmers, ranchers, in the bush, in the mines, in the mills. I mean, death and dismemberment and that sort of thing. That was, that was normal, that was daily. Uh, people get their hands cut off. Uh, that's what happens when you're in sawmills. No one thought anything about that. That was like as natural as going and shooting a deer or killing a cow. Uh, you do that. There's a whole other world that develops in cities and places like that, that I've lived in as well, where you're sort of separated from death. I mean, people do the deaths for you, and you just, uh, you feed off of them vicariously. I mean, chicken in the city comes in a plastic bag. Uh, chicken in the country or in the small towns when I grew up was an animal that walked around, and you cut its head off and ate it. Uh, it's a totally different sort of reality. I was very involved, I think, in death and... Uh, and the renewal that comes at a death. So I guess to some degree, probably that may be one of the themes of my work, that kind of the renewal that comes out of a constantly rolling and turning sort of concept that twists around the process of life and death. And that's not a new theme. I mean, my God, that's the theme of literature. Patrick Lane believes that he was one of the first post-war poets in Western Canada to write about working-class people, but he doesn't think of himself as belonging to one school of poets or another. Critics and reviewers, unable to identify Lane with any particular group, have named him Maverick, and, with his poems about workers in small Western towns in mind, a redneck. Well, people are always trying to, to pigeonhole you. They're they're trying to categorize you all the time. They want to make me into a mountain poet or they want to make me into a redneck poet. I mean, they want to isolate everyone all the time. The, the endless concern in this country to regionalize the writer, in a sense, to bring him down into terms that they can cope with. And that, that may be a Canadian problem because we're made up of such a, a huge half a continent. But it's too easy and it's too glib. Uh, we don't say that about the lake poets in England. We don't say that about other people. Uh, in a sense, I suppose I am a redneck poet, in the sense that maybe I come from the working class and I come from uh, the stock of Western people and, uh, you know, people in the East will categorize them all as rednecks. I mean, what does that mean? It means they're uncivilized people? That's simply nonsense. First job, first serious job I ever had, which meant, you know, a full-time job. I'd worked a variety of many things up to that point, but... I was 17 and I got a job, 18, and I got a job uh, when they were building the Rogers Pass Highway. And I got a job driving Packer Cat and those big cats with all those big Packer rollers behind them and packed the highway down. I lied and told them I knew how to run the cat and luckily the guy who'd been on it before me didn't turn it off. And uh, I learned how to drive a cat. <laughs> I packed parts of the environment that had, that were never intended to be packed by a caterpillar tractor. I mean, there are plants that will never grow again. In certain parts, near Craig Allocke, you'll find large swaths through the forest. <laughs> anyway, it's a poem called Elephants. Elephants. The cracked cedar bunkhouse 
hangs behind me like a gray pueblo in the sundown, where I sit to carve an elephant from a hunk of brown soap for the Indian boy who lives in the village a mile back in the bush. The alcoholic truck driver and the cat skinner sit beside me with their eyes closed, all of us waiting out the last hour until we go back on the grade. And I try to forget the forever clank, clank, clank across the grade, pounding stones and earth to powder for hours in mosquito darkness of the endless cold mountain night. The elephant takes form. My knife caresses smooth soap scaling off curls of brown, which the boy saves to take home to his mother in the village. Finished, I hand the carving to him, and he looks at the image of the great beast for a long time, then sets it on dry cedar and looks up at me. What's an elephant, he asks. So I tell him of the elephants and their jungles, the story of the elephant graveyard, which no one has ever found, and how the silent animals of the rainforest go away to die somewhere in the limber lost of distances. And he smiles, tells me of his father's graveyard, where his people have been buried for years. So far back, no one remembers when it started. And I ask him where the graveyard is, and he tells me it's gone now where no one will ever find it, buried under the grade of the new highway. I look back at a poem like Elephants, the kind of fondness, because it happened so long ago. The event that it describes happened now, 30 years ago, and the poem itself, 20 years ago. So it's like uh, a distant sort of wonderful stranger wrote it. Uh, I wouldn't really think to tamper with it particularly. If I was to write that poem now, I would write it probably very differently. I would, my styles have changed, the, the way I approach language changes, but I would never pretend to tamper with it in a way. I just, uh, I look at it, it's like uh, an old, old friend. Poetry has an endless future in Canada or anywhere else. I don't think that you can stop people from writing. Uh, and I don't think you can, uh, you can invest in, in, in poetry. All you can do in a country like Canada is you can create an am energy, an ambience where poetry can be made. Uh, uh, in some ways, I think there should be more struggle even in the making of poetry or the making of art. It's become very easy to make art in our country. And I think we're surrounded consequently by a great deal of competent art. Uh, I grew up in a very, a very tough society, and not that I'm making myself unique. I think most writers grew up in, a, in, in strange, odd, unique, difficult places, and out of that, I think out of the pain of that and out of the struggle, they make an art. And it's come to the point that art can be made out of an easy chair forever, and I think you recognize easy chair art and you recognize the other kind. Uh, poetry is poetry. It's always there. It's always been there. People will always, I think, sing.